Let's get into the word. All right, let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you, Lord, that there is so much going on, that uh, we're not a church that is, that is dead but alive, God, with, with you and all the things that you're, you're doing. And we, God, just uh, lift up those different things that are going on, the different ministries that need help. And I do want to lift Vacation Bible School up to you, Lord, that uh, you would just bless that and, and get the... Uh, volunteers ready, the kids ready, that they would just be blessed by that and the, the high school camp and all those things that are coming up. And we certainly want to lift up the upcoming resurrection celebration, Lord, of just praying that you would move on the hearts of the people, God, that uh, you would bring the people there that, that need to hear the gospel, that God, you would just do a mighty work there that weekend, and that you would do a mighty work here tonight as well, Lord, as we open your word. We, we know that your word will not return void, God, and that you, uh, you would bless this time, God. I pray that your, your heart would be our heart, God, and that you would just open our hearts and our minds to receive all that you have for us. And God, we do lift up our pastor, pray that you would be with Pastor Pat, that you would uh, just touch his, uh, his body, that you would heal him and... Uh, raise him up and get him get him well soon lord and so father again we just thank you for your word and we ask these things lord in jesus name amen he hebrews chapter 11 again one of those passages that is probably well known to us the referred to as the uh the faith chapter of looking at uh at faith and and how god moved on on different ones called the kind of the hall of faith there, if you will, of, of the different uh, of the different ones who have walked by faith that we have the the record here of and hopefully encouraging each one of us to to really put our faith and trust in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to really you know, sometimes we go along and we, we know the Lord and we walk with the Lord, but just really doing that total surrender to Him and, and really putting all our eggs in that basket, if you will, of just really asking Him and, and relying on Him for everything in our life, everything that, that we have, everything that we will be, that as we look at some of the people that are in the Hall of Faith, and we're not obviously going to be able to go through all of them, but just kind of looking at some of that. But really, I, I think looking at this, of really looking at our own lives, of where we are, of, of how trusting we are with the Lord in those situations where maybe it doesn't make sense, maybe where we don't quite understand, but that we would put our faith in, in, in the creator of the universe, in the one who holds everything in his hands, that we should and know that we can trust him for everything. And as we start here looking at, the, at verse 1 of chapter 11, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And I... Wanted to see just exactly what Webster had to say about faith. The what some of the the definitions that that the the dictionary had, and it, you know some of these is is faith is to trust, unquestioning belief, specifically in God or religion, etc. A particular religion, complete trust and confidence, our loyalty, and I'm. Thinking, you know, that, that we could read that, that now faith is that complete trust or confidence in God, in things not seen, in things not heard. I like Oswald Sanders said this about faith. He says, faith enables the believer's soul to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. I thought that was really, really good, that through faith, we can treat the future as the present, as that we can walk in the truth that God has given us, those future promises, if you will, those things that he has promised you and I, as if 
they have already taken place because in God's eyes they have. Because God's promises are true. God's promises are sure. That everything that God has promised, He is going to fulfill in His time. And I think that's one of the things that, that I really looked at here as we look at this chapter, that God made promises to Abraham, to, to the, the elders, as it says here in, in verse 2, that for by it the elders obtained a good testimony, that, that he made those promises and they believed that. And because of believing and putting their faith in that, we'll see that it caused them to react. It caused them to act upon that faith, upon that truth that God had given them, that God had promised them, that God had showed them. And, and as I looked at that, that if we really have faith and we really trust and really put our total confidence, complete trust in God, it's going to make us then move. It's going to make us do something and act upon that truth that God has given us. That it's going to give us that, that assurance that God's going to do what He said He was going to do. And because of the Scripture, because of what we have, we have that evidence so much more as I look at some of these people, how much faith did they have to have when they didn't have all that we have today of the promises that God has kept, that the prophecies that have been fulfilled, those things that have been, that God has shown as we, as we look forward to a couple of weeks to resurrection celebration, one of those things that we have is the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in that truth, then we also have that promise that not only was Christ resurrected, that we will be resurrected, that we will be with Him. So that's, we can live our lives in the truth that God has already done that, that we are His children, that we as through faith in Jesus Christ can walk in that fullness of life because of what God has done, because of the promises that He's made. And we can look at what God has done in the past and know that He's going to be faithful in the future, just as he was faithful to these people, he is faithful to us. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we can trust that. We can understand that. And, we can, and it will cause us <clears throat> to hopefully walk in that. I also looked up substance. You know, when you sometimes, you know, if you're like me, you kind of read through things and you kind of go, okay, I know what that means. And, and probably most of you do. But I needed to look it up. So when you look at that, the substance, I like this. The real are essential part of anything. So when you look at that, that now faith is the real part or the essential part of things hoped for. That because of our faith, we have that hope that never fails. We have that hope in Jesus Christ, that hope that only He can give, that we have that assurance that God will complete what He has, what he has promised that He will do. And as we, again, look at verse 2, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. You know, I want to have a good testimony. I want my life to reflect what God has done for me that I want my testimony to be that God is faithful, that God is true, that people can look at how I conduct myself and walk in that, that people would, that there would be that, that good testimony that he really believes what he's talking about, that he walks the walk, not only talks the talk, but he walks that walk, that, that and I, I would pray that, that each one of us here tonight, that would be our goal, that that would be what we would want, is that, that good testimony. And as we look at verse 3, he says, by, by faith we understand that the world was framed 
by the word of God, so that the things which were seen were not made of things that are visible. He goes all the way back to creation here because that's where really faith begins, is that we, if we don't believe the first verse of Genesis, then it's going to affect, I believe, our faith in everything else. And in Genesis 1, I think, you know, it is just, God just puts it out there. In the beginning, God. The first four words of the Bible. In the beginning, God. He doesn't explain himself. He doesn't try to prove himself. He just states the fact that in the beginning, God created. That God created this earth. That God created you and I. That God is the one who keeps this all together. That God is the one that sustains. That the world was framed by the word of God. That God spoke this into existence. That God simply, the power of his word, just spoke this into existence. That it wasn't some big bang. It wasn't some big thing. It was simply God speaking truth, speaking this into existence so that we can understand that and we can, that we can hang everything on that, that, that if God is the creator and God is the one who's holding this all together, then we owe God everything because he is the one who's given us everything and that it was made not of things visible, but from things that were invisible, that he just simply spoke them into existence from nothing. And we understand that you can't get something from nothing unless you're God. And speak that because, you know, when people go, well, something had to be eternal. And it's God. That God has spoke this into existence, that God holds us all together, that God therefore knows what we need before we know what we need, that God is the one that we need to be searching for and looking for, and so that we can treat the things of the future as if they're present. So often in the scriptures we see that God speaks things as if they've already happened about our salvation, about our holiness, about our sanctification, that he says that we are. And the problem is, we don't always feel that. We don't always act like that. But the truth of the matter is, God's saying that's who we are. That we are holy and righteous in his sight because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because of what Christ did on the cross. And you know, again, later we're going, to, we're going to partake of communion, remembering that death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that sacrifice that he made so that we can have this faith, so, so that we can have this assurance that we are going to spend eternity with him. And the beauty of, of that is, is walking by faith is we can experience God as our forefathers, as the elders here, as it says, experienced God as they walked with him. Because our salvation is not just for eternity, not for just when we die. Our relationship with God is here and now and experiencing him in his fullness right now. Not just when we die and go to be with him for eternity, but we can walk with him, we can experience that peace and that joy that only God can give as we walk with him, as we surrender ourselves to him. And the more that we trust him and the more that we exercise that faith, the more it grows. The more that we, you know, I've never given things to God that he didn't follow through, that he didn't make happen. I have never been disappointed when I surrendered things to God because He's always faithful. He's always perfect. And he's always there for us. He starts there at creation. And then 
Then he goes to Abel. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gift, and through it, being dead, still speaks. That we still, you know, what did, when, when God confronted Cain about, where's your brother? He said, he told him, his blood speaks, cries out from the ground. And his testimony still today speaks to you and I of his faithfulness to God. That he was faithful to do what God had called him to do. And, you know, as you, if you, you know, if you're not familiar with some of these stories, because we're not really going to go deep into them tonight, because again, time is not going to permit. But if you haven't, go back and study these guys. Go back and study what God did in and through them. And, and we see there that, that Abel brought what God had commanded, obviously, and, and maybe it was just a matter of his heart. I don't know. It doesn't really tell us. It could have been that, that, that Cain's heart just wasn't right before God as he brought the sacrifice. There's a lot of different theories there, but it, it, they really don't matter. But I, you know, as we've been looking at the Old Testament, as the prophets have been uh, warning Israel all along about, hey, if you don't turn, this is what's going to happen. And, and I love the, the part that, that when they brought those offerings, when they brought that to the Lord and, and Cain was pretty torqued about it, going, well, you know, I'm downcast. I'm, you know, you didn't. God said, Cain, get a hold because sin is crouching at the door. And we see what happens when we don't listen to what God has called us to do. We see that because of the jealousy, because of that, he killed his brother. And we see further that even in that, God was merciful to him. But we see that through that, again, read that and, and study that if you haven't. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Again, that would be a great thing to have on your tombstone, wouldn't it? He pleased God. I'm not going to have one because I'm going to go into rapture. So, <laughs> if not, they're just going to throw me out in the ditch. So, I'm not going to have one anyway. But, <laughs> but wouldn't that be, the, isn't that the testimony that you want? He pleased God. He walked with God. And I love that. He walked with God and God just took him away. It says he went out for a walk and he just kept walking and just obviously found the stairway to heaven and just kind of walked <laughs> and he was no more. And I was just sitting there thinking this afternoon as I was reading this, studying this, what his family must have thought. <laughs> there was posters all over, missing person. <laughs> what happened to Enoch? I don't know, he went out for a walk and never come home. <laughs> Pretty cool that God did that and that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder to those who diligently seek him. That we're told here that it is impossible to please God without faith. That it takes that faith in God. And again, because here we have Enoch who walked with God, who pleased God, who obviously had a real faith in God to be pleasing to God. And it tells us right there that it's not, you're not going to please God by your works, by your actions, it's by faith. It's by accepting that and walking in the truth that God has given us. By walking in that truth 
And again, these guys didn't have a lot of, a lot of truth. Or they didn't have a lot of examples as we do as of what God can and will do. But yet their faith caused them to do what they did and to experience God in a way that is amazing as you read their stories and as you look at, at what God done. By faith, Noah, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Look at Noah. God said, I'm going to destroy, I'm going to wipe out mankind. Noah, we, we're told that Noah was a righteous man, that Noah walked with the Lord, that Noah was pleasing to, the God, to God as well. And so we see here that, that Noah built that ark through ridicule, through not knowing, but believing God caused him to do that. And, and it's interesting, I, you know, one of the commentaries was pointing out that, you know, you see that Noah obviously was a man of integrity in his own home, that he led his family in the way of the Lord because his sons and wives were all on that ark with him, that he... And, and to me, that, you know, that speaks volumes to me as, as a dad, as, as a man of the leader that God has told us to be in the household, that that influence and the way that we conduct ourselves in our homes and around others is so important that the whole world rejected his, his message, but obviously his family, and I believe it was because of the way that Noah walked. It was because of the things that Noah, Noah did that his family was, was there on the ark. And I don't know, you know, it, we're told that he had the three sons. I don't know if there were more or not. We're not told. But we are told that, that his family was saved through his faith and his example of walking with the Lord. And I believe that's incredible and incredibly important for us that not only for our families, but again, as, as we are in public, as we're in that sphere of influence that God has placed us in, that we walk in that truth and we walk in that faith and we exhibit that faith that others can see that God is real, that he's real to us, that we believe those things. And the other thing that I see as we continue on and look at some of these different people that, that we have here. The thing that I know is they weren't perfect. Is they didn't do this perfectly either. But what they did have was a faith to act on the things that God told them to do. That as we look at Abraham, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. And by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That Abraham obeyed God to a point. He didn't do it perfectly. First of all, we see him going so far and waiting a while, and then we see Hedaran, then we see him moving forward. We see him make a really bad decision, I believe, of, of taking his nephew Lot. Caused him a lot, of, a lot of problems. But as we see Abraham Walking and God making that promise is, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. His neighbor, Abraham, I'm going to do a mighty work in you. And Abraham's going, but I don't have any kids and Sarah's barren. And we see that to a point he trusted him until things 
went along and he said, you know, I'm not, God, you're not fast enough. God, you're not doing things in my timetable. And we see that, that him and Sarah decided that, that they needed a, a, to help God out a little bit. Never a good idea. It's still causing problems because of that. And so we see that, again, these guys, these people were not perfect, but they served a perfect God. And that even in our frailties and in, even in our failures, God remains faithful. And God will do what God's promised to do. You know, some of the people that, that we read about in this chapter, you're thinking, seriously, God, they're in the hall of faith? Wow. But what does God tell us? That man looks on the outside, God looks at the heart. And I believe, again, that's what the, the difference, in my humble opinion, between Cain and Abel was a matter of the heart. Whatever the offering was, whether that was right, wrong, or whatever, it was a matter of the heart of not doing things the way that God had commanded them to do it. And I believe that so often we want to do things our way. So many times people, you know, I want to do and come to God in their own way. And God's going, no, there's one way to come to me. There's one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. That there's no other way. That it's not through works. It's not through that. But, as James tells us, our faith will cause us to act, to work. Because out of that will, will come good works, not to salvation, but because of that. Because we trust God. If I really trust something, I'm going to put my weight into it, if you will. I'm going to put my effort into it. I'm going to walk in that. By, by faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in, in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And is that not the very promise that God made to Abraham? And again, as I was thinking about that, sometimes you never know how God's going to use that small thing in your life. Maybe you look at it and Abraham's going, I only had one kid. But God says, I'm going to take that one son Actually, he had two, but God only recognized one of them, if you will. That I'm going to take that, what you see small, what you see as insignificant maybe, and I'm going to do miraculous things through that. Sometimes we may not see great movement, and we may not see what God's doing, but yet that one life that we touch, that one thing that we do, that God may use that in a mighty and a powerful way, that God may do that in, in a miraculous way and use that in our life, in other people's lives, and we may never see it. Guess what? Abraham never saw all that God did. And we're told at the end of these cha this chapter that these died never really seeing the fulfillment of that promise, but yet they were steadfast to walk in it, even though they didn't see the end result. And that doesn't mean that God was not faithful. God was faithful, and He continued to do what He promised to do, even though we may never see that. We may never experience some of that, but the thing that I do know that we will experience is that salvation and that resurrection and that promise of being with Him forever. The other thing that I know that we will experience of him walking with us through the trials, through the hard times, through the difficult times, through the good times as well. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on, this, on the earth. 
that they realized that this wasn't their home, that their home was in heaven. And I believe that too often we hold too tight to the things of this world, that we get so caught up and so wound up into things of this world that we end up not experience God the way that God wants to, us to experience Him. That we don't really let God work in our lives the way that He wants to work in our life because we hold on so tight to the things of this earth, to the things of this world, and that we cling to those. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland and truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has pre prepared a city for them. I don't want God to be ashamed to call me his child. That that's so awesome to think that God said, I'm not ashamed to call them because I have prepared a city for them, a heavenly place. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. What an incredible faith that took. What an incredible thing that God made a promise that out of this son, I'm going to raise up a nation. And then God says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. What faith that took for Abraham to say, you know what, God? This makes zero sense to me. You made a promise that you're going to use him, that you're going to do this, and now you're telling me to sacrifice him? But he was assured that even if he did, that God would raise him up, that God was able to, to do because he believed the promises of God. That is faith. That is incredible faith to think that he would do that. And, and again, we know the story that God provided for him. As Abraham experienced God in a magnificent way because of that faith, because of seeing the power of God, of God as God said, I will prepare for myself a sacrifice. That as he was ready to do what God had called him to do, God said, stop. There's a ram. Take that. And, you know, as we not only faith in Abe with for Abraham, but Isaac, he wasn't a little kid. He was probably 30-some years old. That it took great faith for him to trust, again, what must have that been like for him going, okay, Dad, I trust you. Wow. But I trust God because, God, I know that you trust God. And so, you know, as we, as we look at this, you know, we're going to kind of skip down here some because we're running out of time. But as you... Look over at verse 30. See some of the effects that, you know, again, by, the, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say, for the time wouldn't fail me, to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson. That's, that's one that you're thinking, really, God? Jephthah, <laughs> also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, 
escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Man, as you read that, as you read that list there of the things that they had got to experience because of faith in a mighty and a holy God, that when we walk with God and we put our faith in him, again, we're going to see God move in a mighty and a powerful way in our life. In those circumstances that, again, make absolutely no sense to us, we will see God move and God do the work that only he can do. And that we will experience God in a way that we will only experience him, experiencing him when we totally surrender and give that faith and give our life to him and let him have total control of our lives. When we, as we're told here, realize that we're just here temporarily, that we, this is not our home. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we have a home not built with hands, but built by God himself that who has prepared that place for us. And that we can see the mighty works of God, that we can see the deliverance of God in circumstances as we walk with him and as we surrender our hearts and our lives to him. Some of this is not all that positive though, is it? They, they were tortured and not accept deliverance that they might obtain. They's gone, you know what? You can kill me, but I'm not denying my God. I'm not going to fold. I'm not going to deny. I'm going to trust God even in death. That I'm going, I, because I believe that God, you will raise me up. That God, you will. Still others had trials of mocking and scourging. Yes, and chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sown and they were sawed in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. God saying, because of their faith and because of them enduring that, the world was not worthy of them. That because of their faith in God, they were able to, and willing to take whatever came their way because they trusted God. And they go, God, I know that you're with me even in these things, that the world was not one, was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having a, obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. What's he saying here? That that same God who protected them, who did that, who gave them that faith, who walked with them is the same God who's going to be with us. And I just want to look here at a couple more verses in chapter 12 because I think it's important. I think it goes with this. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all these that went before us that we've read about, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, the faith is not something that we work up. The faith is a gift from God. But I do believe that as we exercise that faith, as we act upon that faith, we will see the power of God. We will experience the presence of God in our life. We will understand that God has our life. And I think it's important that he says here, get rid of the weight, get rid of the sin, and run the race that God has set before each and every one of us. 
Because as we look at these people, every one of them had a different race to run, if you will. Each one of us has a different race to run that God has placed before us. And he's going, let us run that with endurance. Let us not weaken. Let us not let the cares of the world ensnare us. But let us walk and let us run in that truth that Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. That Christ will finish the work that he started in us. That God will never leave us or forsake us. That we can that we can take that to the bank, if you will, that we can have that assurance of everlasting life with Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to uh, observe here in just a couple minutes. So why don't we stand up and pray? Father God, I thank you for these witnesses. I thank you for those that have went before that have shown great faith in you that we might have these witnesses and these examples of your power and your majesty and your glory. And that God, just as you were with them every step of that way, that God, you are with us. That God, that we will obtain that relationship with you as well. That we look forward to that time. We do say, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for, for your presence and for your truth. And so, God, I just ask that you would just help each one of us to walk in that truth and in that faith. And that, God, we would experience you in a whole new and powerful way as we trust you and walk with you. So, Father, I thank you again for your word and for these truths. And so, Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.